Okay, I believe we should be live. Let's okay. do it. All right. Well, welcome to uh, welcome to part three. Um, well, this is strategy session three, uh, part two. Uh, we're still on an overview of conflicts for prehistory to 1500. And we're going to be discussing periodization and the rise of militant cultures. Uh, now, pretty brief. Oh, I'm, I'm getting a little feedback. I think. Can we okay. Okay. All right. Great. So. Uh, very briefly, just let's discuss periodization, what exactly the term means. Uh, I have it up here on the screen, but uh, the, the textbook definition is basically it's a, it's a process or study uh, or, or categorization of the past into uh, specific blocks, uh, quantified block name blocks to kind of facilitate our study of the past. And I, I put a note on here that it relies upon a Western centric uh, sort of generalization. Uh, and I, I don't necessarily mean that um, it's biased to the point where everything is viewed through a Western lens, but uh, a great deal of the historical record, as we previously discussed, uh, comes from written documents. And the Western world, you know, specifically in Europe, is where we see the the rise of academic history and the real uh, the real dedicated study of the past. So a lot of these studies over the years, um, academics have based their their foundation and their starting point based upon Western records. So they tend to carpet, uh, um, they tend to basically partition everything into periods that are um, very specific to the European experience. Mm -hmm. um, so the the one disclaimer I will I will add uh, before the one I'd like to address before we continue through this uh, lesson today is when we're referring to these different ages and these different transitions and different periods. Um, they didn't necessarily all occur at the same time for every civilization. They didn't necessarily all occur at the same time in uh, different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And in between these periods, we're going to throw out these numbers, uh, rough numbers, you know, 2000 BC, 800 AD, things of that nature. Um, it wasn't as if someone flipped a switch and we, we had a, a major change overnight and everyone woke up around the world. And there was this, uh, you know, sort of uh, international recognition that we've, we, we as a civilization have ascended to a different epic in history or a different period in history. There are more gradual changes that took place over time. But again, we assign these numbers uh, from an academic perspective just to really facilitate the study of the past and provide us with a sound foundation from which to move forward through history, through the past, and um, explore the study of, of the history, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, that said, um, the periods and eras we're going to be looking at, we're going to pull up some maps here shortly. Um, but the where it all starts is um, with prehistory, what we call proto-history. And this is the period between the appearance of uh, first humans approximately 3 million years ago. And we're, we're talking about first humans. We're talking about not necessarily modern day humans, but some of the proto-species of humans that would eventually develop into, you know, what we recognize as a modern human today, Homo sapiens. And this is a time of uh, competing interests between species, between um, you know, the, the Cro-Magnons and uh, the Homo erectus and, and all that evolutionary bit. A lot of the records here, especially when you go, you know, as far back as the initial appearance of humans, uh, rely upon archaeological and anthropolog anthropological evidence. Uh, and it's not so much the, the, the wheelhouse of history, so to speak, but it is nevertheless a, an essential component of it because, you know, we're examining the, the far past and, and you know, where, where we came from, how everything started. Um, in 3300 BC, approximately 3300 BC, is where we see the invention of writing systems, and that's where that's where historical studies and historical record really begin to take flight. Um, because I, I have to know here, so, you know, the span of recorded history is roughly less than 5,000 years old, and that's that's kind of a fantastic number if you just think about it. You know, we we as uh, an evolving species as humans have been around for approximately you know. Um, you know, I, I would say the, the our, in our in our current state uh, as Homo sapiens, modern humans, uh, you know, we've been around for several hundred thousand years. But the span of recorded history uh, is less than five thousand years old. So we've only been actually recording history in the written word for a very small fraction of our overall existence. Mm -hmm. And we've made such tremendous leaps and bounds, uh, evolutionary leaps and bounds, in regards to you know biologically and and with our technology. And one of the common themes you'll you'll notice as we examine these periods is the rate at which our development accelerates throughout history. 
Mm. Uh, as, as a species is as, as the years pass and as the, the periods become a bit more compact and more dense, more things are happening in a short period of time and societies and civilizations are involved more quickly. But um, I'll start in most uh, cities in civilizations before writing. I'm sorry. Did we have organized cities before writing was invented? Yes. I mean, the, the, oh. the earliest, the, the, I mean, it, they, it happened. Um, organized cities and settlements occurred shortly before um, writing. Uh, the agrarian revolution, the agrarian movement is, depending on which source you consult, is uh, traced back to about 6000 BC. Um, you know, prior to that, around 12,000 BC is when we, we saw uh, the last the last great sheets of ice in, in North America recede. And we had migrations continuing on for another 6,000 years. Uh, and then uh, permanent settlements, agrarian settlement, settlements began to spring up around 6,000 BC. And uh, uh, between 4,000 and 3,000 BC, depending on the records and how the historical dating works, is where we start to see the rise of writing, which, which makes sense if you think about it, because with the rise of permanent settlements and grain surplus, we see a, a rise in uh, a growth in populations and diversified labor. And that allows people to uh, certain segments of society to free themselves up. So you begin to see the rise of different um, occupational classes. You know, we, we, we see that people just don't have to hunt and gather anymore. We have farmers, there are artisans that are beginning to take shape, people that uh, are just uh, interested in improving the structures around them. And they start making these amazing, uh, you know, wonders of the world and, you know, pyramids and various uh, defensive fortifications. And of course, we have scholars who devote their time to developing the written word um, more as a point of administration than uh, scholarly works. Uh, their early, earliest works were cuneiform or cuneiform, um, which were um, symbols impressed in, uh, in clay tablets and then baked to harden the tablets so they wouldn't uh, lose their um, the, the, the information kept on them. And mm -hmm. initially those were, those were used strictly for record keeping purposes. Um, so we see a lot of, uh, written, uh, records dealing with business transactions or, um, you know, the amount of grain stores, things of that nature. Gotcha. Uh, <clears throat> but yes, uh, there were, there were standing very early standing civilizations before the written word. And we gather the majority of information about them from the archeological record because gotcha. written records. All right. Interesting. Yeah, and and also why well, we'll throw in there you, you have like the the old kingdom in, in Egypt um, who didn't necessarily have a written language so to speak but they used um, you know hieroglyphics which obviously you see those in a lot of <clears throat> it's very common in a lot of specials about Egypt where you see all the different um, pictographs and hieroglyphics so that that was the earliest forms of written language. Mm -hmm. okay. Now the Stone Age is essentially broken down into uh, four eras, and again it's it's mm -hmm. who you. It's who, it's who you consult and who you talk to. Some, some only recognize three eras. But the first one, uh, the Paleolithic Age, uh, paleo uh, means, uh, uh, literally translates to ancient in, oh. in Greek. Oh, is that what that means? Paleo is ancient. All right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, again, you'll see that these, these prefixes here that denote the specific area of the Stone Age, they all come from Greek, which of course is a Western civilization. So they were some of the first to uh, take interest in, in studying these things. So um, paleo ancient, um, uh, this is the earliest period of the stone age. And that itself is divided in three phases, the lower, middle, and the upper. And the lower is the time of archaic human species that we, that I made reference to before. A lot of the um, competing uh, erect human species that would eventually, you know, homo sapiens would <clears throat> win out that battle of course and uh, rise to uh, uh, preeminence. Uh, across the world. The middle Paleolithic age uh, is where we see the species coexisting with one another and competing with one another. The upper Paleolithic is where we see the worldwide expansion of modern humans and the disappearance of earlier species, Neanderthals, Cro-Magnons, um, and uh, all, all the ones that have faded into obscurity. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and this is also the upper Paleolithic is where we see some of the first pictographs and some of the first cave paintings. Um, there's a lot of sites in uh, what's present day France um, where there are very ancient uh, drawings and pictographs they discovered in um, very intricate and complicated uh, subterranean systems. 
that show that provide us with some insight in the fact that um, early humans that were living in the Paleolithic era weren't necessarily as crude as we might imagine that they were because they were able to um, kind of live in these somewhat sophisticated societies underground and, you know, began writing and recording what was happening to them. So uh, not exactly just the brutish caveman that we all imagined during that era. Mm-hmm. Uh, moving on from about 10,000 to 5,000 BC, roughly, is the Mesolithic era, era with meso meaning middle. Mm-hmm. And that's when the, um, that's essentially when the ice age, uh, when, when the ice, the last great ice age uh, came to an end and the ice uh, sheets began to recede into um, somewhat more like we, we see today with just, we have the, the major ice caps in the, the Arctic and the Antarctic and, and the majority of uh, the uh, rest of the world is a uh, uh, inhabitable era area. Um, so this is again, this is a pre-agricultural period where we see uh, migrations, continental migrations taking place. Um, but the mass migrations of the past where where uh, peoples may have um, gone from uh, Europe to North America would have would, would have started ceasing at this point because <clears throat> land bridges and ice bridges would have melted away. Mm, okay. Uh, the uh, Neolithic period, uh, Neo yeah, meaning new. You. So they say mm-hmm. agriculture like phased in between 10,000 and 5,000 BC. Is that the idea? Yeah, r- roughly 6,000 is uh, 6,000 BC is the approximate. Uh, That's the, the, the approximate process. line where we see that. And, and um, I think the common term, I, I don't know for you, but at least when I was when I was being taught in uh, American public schools is the, the, the phrase was agricultural revolution. Yeah. And that's, that's, I, I, it's kind of a, dis, it's kind of a misnomer because it wasn't necessarily a revolution per se. Uh-huh. Uh, it, it didn't happen in a matter of a few years and there wasn't an organized uh, national push because there wasn't even nations yet, but there, it, there wasn't was a revolting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, 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 well, the, well, there wasn't, a, there wasn't an orchestrated effort on behalf of all these societies to have a, have a revolution and say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm done hunting. Let's, let's throw down the bows and throw down the arrows and we're going to, we're going to start growing crops. It was more of an agricultural movement that occurred mm-hmm. over thousands of years and uh, approximately five, 6,000 BC is where we start to see the rise of agrarian societies and permanent settlements that are relying upon farming techniques mm-hmm. instead of hunting and gathering. And can you remind me the definition of that word agrarian? Agrarian societies are just those that are, are societies that rely upon agriculture. Oh, okay, so, sure. Yeah, so agriculture and crops, as opposed to nomadic hunter gatherers, that you know, every day you're. It, it was a major transition in that you know your nomadic hunter gatherers every day. Uh, it's it's like the paleo movement in in mm-hmm. physical fitness. You know, a lot of the dieting and and a lot of the workouts you see nowadays. Yep. Paleo, meaning ancient, is essentially you wake up, you go out mm-hmm. and you hunt for your breakfast. And once you, once you cook it, if you have fire and you eat it, you rest for a little bit, then you're going to go out and hunt for lunch, find that, and then, you know, hunt for dinner. There weren't any, there essentially were not many ways to store your food. Salting and refrigeration obviously came, mm. in, came about much, much, much later. Mm. Um, so the, in, in ancient times, before we had agrarian or settled societies, uh, populations stayed relatively low because they, they had the, these small groups of peoples had to, had to follow basically the herd animals that they hunted or the migratory patterns of the animals they hunted. So they were constantly on the move uh, and constantly just fighting for survival of food. And it allowed oh, so them- So they just hung around, like, you know, animals just kind of like migrate themselves and sort of move around and the mm-hmm. tribes would just go with the, the animals and pick them off as needed, but stick around near the herds of animals. Yeah, and, that, and that's what we refer to as a pastoral society uh, uh. because they, uh, pastoral societies, that, that came along a bit later where initially hunter gatherers were just hunting wild animals and mm. there, there wasn't necessarily uh, concrete migratory patterns, but they would just uh-huh. go out and hunt. Yep. And then some societies, especially those that lived on great plains where there were, there were large uh, pastoral animals, pastoral society, uh, um, herds of animals, you know, like your, your cows and your bison and stuff like that. Yep. They would learn to kind of skirt around the edges of these large herds of animals who yep. are much easier to hunt than you yep. know trekking through the jungle and getting eaten by a tiger or whatever, uh, and they would they would match the migratory patterns of these animals who would you know move from place to place throughout the season to find uh, grasses to feed on, and that's where you see um, uh, the, the, that's some of the defining characteristics of pastoral warrior cultures such as like the, the Huns, uh, Chinggis Khan, 
um, all, all these these barbarian cultures that we see come down from cent the Central Asian steppe, and um, they they were pastoral societies where they you know a lot of them lived in these little yurts, which are uh, are you familiar with a yurt? Have you seen any of those before? No. A yurt's a type of um, it's kind of like a type of tent, and it's still used in many parts of modern day Central Asia, Mongolia, places like that, <clears throat> with migratory societies. But they're essentially tents that you can um, collapse and move mm -hmm. on the go. But they the the they're they're built the the foundation of them is is built in such a way that it, it starts kind of with in the earth, and then uh, it it takes advantage of some of the natural features of the earth to keep the people inside warm. It's a, it's a really ingenious little structure. It's pretty it's pretty cool if you ever had a chance to check them out. But um, yeah, that's what these societies did. Is they just basically moved from place to place, and yeah. they they eventually domesticated uh, through animal husbandry. Which animal husbandry is the 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 they they would they would catch wild horses and they would domesticate them and they would breed them, and they eventually tame the horses so that they could on horseback ride after these large mammals and shoot them with bows and arrows and then there, there's your meat and then they learn you know salting techniques and storage techniques um but again even in those societies you're constantly on the move and you're constantly hunting and you're constantly yeah. chasing these herds of animals which doesn't allow for much diversified labor so that's why in societies like um like cultures as recent as some of the plains indian societies from the 18th century uh, you know, we're looking at these societies in the 1700s that mm. encountered that that were fighting with the U.S. Army uh, mm. uh, in the 1800s on on the Great Plains. These societies were pastoral nomadic societies that relied on buffalo to survive. Yeah. And they didn't have a written language. Many, many, oh, many yeah. of the tribes did not have a written language because oh. they they just didn't have the specialization within their culture to do so. So a lot of their histories were passed down through oral histories and, and traditional stories. All right. Yeah. Um, but let's see, getting back on target here. Uh, where were we? Oh, yeah. So the agriculture revolution, that just it kind of sums up there. That's where uh, the civilizations, uh, societies, basically, they, they branched out into two distinct directions. Uh, and a majority of what we see develop into empires that influence the course of history. Those are agrarian societies because they settled. They were able to engage in diversified labor. They had explosive population growth, and that in turn led to the construction of more sophisticated cities to defend themselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, from raiders uh, and uh, the rise of ruling classes, you know, monarchies, kings, uh, organized religion, and, and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the last era of the Stone Age is uh, the... Uh, Chalcolithic era, which uh, translates to copper, uh -huh. and that, that this will take us. And I'll pull up a map in a second. But with the introduction of metallurgy and smelting, and the manipulation of metals, um, yeah. that brings us out of the Stone Age into the Bronze Age. Bronze Age, and this <clears throat> that that transitional area, the, that 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 transition where humans began to manipulate metals is very significant. Um, because it metals obviously improve the quality of the tools you work with, which lead to advances in farming um, and infrastructure, um, construction, and of course, uh, warfare and combat, uh, because we, we see more sophisticated weapons as men uh, manipulate metal. So was copper so important because without copper, you've just got iron that rusts? Or well, what's well, uh, copper is um, from a um, from a material perspective. If you're an if you're an artisan or a copper smith, it's mm -hmm. much easier to manipulate. It's much it's much more malleable than iron. Uh, it's much easier to pound into shape. Also, it, they uh, use pure copper. Pure so copper, use, yes. Oh, okay, okay. I was thinking like yeah. bronze is like iron with some copper or something. Is is that the idea? I can't remember. Uh, bronze is copper and tin. Bronze is copper and tin. Okay. Copper right. and tin, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And yeah, copper in itself in its purest form uh, is very malleable. It has a much more, it has a much lower melting point than iron. So mm -hmm. it's easier to smelt and extract from from uh, the ore that you don't need, you know, the, the worthless rocks and things like that. So it's easier, it's an easier metal to extract. It's an easier metal to work with. Uh, 
And okay. it's, it's relatively uh, abundant compared to tin, which comes a bit later. Tin, tin is actually uh, one of the more rare uh, metals on yeah. earth. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it was much more difficult for them to locate and extract than just copper by itself. So that's why, that's why societies didn't immediately jump to the, to the bronze age because first they had to locate and utilize tin and okay. then someone had to get the idea of how, how to mix tin with copper in the correct quantities to come out with usable bronze. And okay. I believe, I believe tin as well. And I don't quote me on this. I'd have to look this one up, but I'm, I'm pretty sure tin in its purest form, I think it's toxic. Oh, it's toxic. I believe it has yeah. some sort of toxic. I, I, in, its, in its purest form, I believe there's a certain level of toxicity to it. Uh -huh. Which is why why the canned goods why they don't they no longer make them out of oh we, yeah we call yeah, tin cans but yeah, they're yeah. not made out of tin yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I, I think it, it, there's a certain hazard with working with it as well so there were certain barriers if you to get, get a over. dint if you get a dint in it and it like starts to oxidize or something then you're gonna yeah. get a problem maybe it's something like that mm -hmm. yeah so um, yeah so we the, the copper age is really the the end of the stone age and that's where we see the rise of a lot of uh, powerful militaries um, the Egyptian uh, the Egyptians had a very powerful and vast army um, that used copper weapons the um, the Hittites and the Assyrians which were two major societies uh, around the same time period were at constant ends uh, constantly fought with the Egyptians mm -hmm. and um, they fought primarily with, with copper weapons mm -hmm. and uh, copper weapons were, were molded and, and, and fashioned in such a way. They're, they're, they're pretty, pretty primitive, obviously. Uh, you know, they were basically fashioned into short knives and swords. Um, but you know, they, they did the job. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, if you put a, put a decent enough edge on there, you're going to be able to hurt somebody pretty bad. So. And when are we talking here for like when they started to use copper? Uh, well, we're looking at the copper work. Uh, this is going to be after the agrarian uh, movement, after 6,000 and leading up to about 4,000, uh, 3,000, depending on the area of the world again. Cool, uh, cool, so gotcha. in, in, in Northern Africa and in, in, um, the Near East, it's around 3,300. But um, we're going to break things up here just for a second. And um, I'm going to pull up our first map. So here's two maps and can you, can you see these well? Is the, is the resolution okay and everything? Can you, can you read? Uh, I mean, as far as the text goes, you'd have to zoom in, but I can see the layout. Okay, okay. So what we'll do is I'm going to zoom in here and then we're gonna take this that. map and we're gonna zoom in here. Now with these, um, these maps, there's only a difference uh, of, about, and, and you know, actually, I'm, I'm gonna zoom out for a sec because I wanna give credit to this individual here. Um, Thomas A. Lessman, uh, yeah, I, I located these maps online before. Um, it hasn't been updated in a considerable period of time. It's been about over 10 years. So there's, there's but nonetheless, this, uh, Mr. I think you did a great job with it and it illustrates a lot what we're, what we're working with today so i just want to give him a little credit sure thing but these first two maps are the, the, the there's only a 300 year difference between these first two maps we're talking from uh 1300 1000 bc and you can see um some of the key differences here now the major colors you see the uh, beginning to rise at the beginning of uh the bronze age are present here uh, the Egyptian, Egyptian Empire we see is uh, very um, predominant here in, in, in Northern Africa, <clears throat> and they but not, not much changed obviously there. Uh, but if you look just as, as an example over 300 years, if you look directly to the south of Egypt, <clears throat> you have India, uh, which was a southern <clears throat> a culture immediately south of the Egyptians that bordered Egypt, and they they were at uh, at odds over time, and they fought one another. And you can see how the Nubians uh, event eventually developed into the, the kingdom of Kush. Okay. Uh, and uh, all, all these societies surrounding here, the Egyptian empire was uh, started out much larger in uh, 1300 BC, and over the course of 300 years, we see the introduction of um, what would become modern-day Israel, some of the uh, Armenian kingdoms, uh, the Neo-Hittites, uh, 
the Endemites. These are all in, in the Arabian pastoral nomadic tribes. These are all societies hailing from the Arabian Peninsula and the, uh, that, that area that we discussed in the last session, the Fertile Crescent. Which so is the Arabian hiding. Peninsula is like, what, is the whole of Saudi Arabia or something? Or Yes. Yeah, this, this, this peninsula right here where we see yeah, the Arabian lot. pastoral nomadic tribes, this large landmass between yep, yep. that's what, right. Good yeah, between, between it really the, is the ultimate peninsula, isn't it? <laughs> yep, yep. So that large landmass between what is modern day Iran and, um, you know, uh, the eastern, uh, northeastern coast of Africa mm -hmm. um, is what we would just call the Arabian Peninsula, which is uh, obviously home to uh, what's uh, Saudi, Saudi Arabia being the largest uh, nation there today. And then I think uh, Oman and uh, let's see. Yemen. Uh, I do have a modern map here just for reference. Yep. So here we go. And there's our modern map. Yeah, Saudi, yeah, uh, Saudi Arabia, Oman, Yemen, mm -hmm. uh, Iraq, Jordan, Israel. So you can see where they all basically came from. But just focusing on the ancient past, the Bronze Age, um, uh, going back to 1000 BC, uh, we see uh, uh, over here to the to the west of Egypt, uh, Saharan pastoral nomadic peoples. Mm -hmm. So again, this this provides us a bit of a contrast. These are nomadic societies operating on plains, hunting, gathering. Over in Egypt, though, where we have the Nile River, which is which is, is very important to the development of yeah, Egyptian right. culture. Yeah, um, right. That's why they were so powerful yeah. in a way. They, like you say, geographic advantage. They had, they had the Nile. Yes. They controlled the Nile. Yeah, and and the Nile. One of the distinguishing characteristics of the Nile River compared to a lot of other rivers is its predictability, and mm -hmm. it they. The, the Egyptians were able to, uh, through observation and keeping records, they were able to predict when, when the river would flood, when it was going to recede, when it was the best time of year to plant crops, when it was the best time to, uh, you know, of course, harvest the crops. And that, that natural resource, the Nile River, gave them access to abundant uh, foods and, and grew their population immensely. And it also acted as a kind of an ancient highway of sorts. Um, because they were able to uh, travel up and down the river uh, with some difficulty because there are some natural obstacles called cataracts or just basically waterfalls where they would have to uh, get out of boats and transfer the boats onto the uh, land and back into the river. Uh, yeah. right. But essentially, it was, a, it was an ancient highway where they were able to uh, trade, uh, move, uh, move a lot of crops up and down the river, and it basically just led to uh, one of the developments of, you know, some of the first empires, you know, some of the first sovereign uh, cultures that began to dominate regions. So, yeah, to the immediate west, we have the Libyan tribes and, you know, we have uh, the Bantu, uh, Bantu people to the south, uh, Kushites, uh, all these, all these, I, I would say, I would say lesser known societies, unless, unless you really study the past, because they weren't agrarian. They didn't permanently settle at this period and they didn't really necessarily make any wonderful structures that have endured to today, such as the pyramids or the Sphinx. Mm -hmm. And they did, they certainly didn't have written language um, like the Egyptians developed uh, later, later on. And, and as we saw in uh, Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescent. And speaking of the Fertile Crescent, uh, you know, we go over here to Assyria uh, and the Kassite Empire and uh, Elam, um, this area between the Tigris and Euphrates, highly contested. And we see uh, more agrarian societies in the early Bronze Age. And it, it develops into what becomes Babylon and Aratu and all these different uh, nations. Right, right, right. Um, so the first, like, you know, successful civilizations were around rivers. Yes. Yeah. And that, that, that exactly, exactly. And, that, and they, they call them uh, river civilizations. Mm -hmm. um, you see the same thing uh, at, at slightly different time frames. You'll see the same thing happening. Uh, if we go back here to 1300 BC, uh, I'm going to zoom in here on India the Indus Valley civilization and Indo-Aryan, uh, the Vedic civilization. That mm -hmm. was another very early sophisticated civilization in human development. And they developed around the Indus River Valley. Uh, the Dravidian peoples, they had a lot of, uh, they were they were a bit more distant from that, that fertile area. Uh, and the Tamil people, they developed into their own uh, significant societies. But it's, it's a similar situation as we, we saw in, as we look over in Africa with, with Egypt and the nomadic people and the tribes on their periphery, we see the same thing in India with the Indus Valley civilizations giving rise to some permanent settlements and um, some of the first uh, sophisticated uh, 
spiritual observations and, and organized religions. Mm. It's interesting uh, how the, you know, the first people to have a successful, you know, civilization where they can defend and live mm-hmm. a live life. <laughs> it's by controlling this useful terrain. Right. Right. I guess that's and, a theme and, for you, right? Yes. And, and in, in regards to that terrain, another thing we need to take in consideration is the, and this goes back to our discussion about biogeography mm-hmm. is the, is the latitude at which a lot of this occurred. The latitude that Egypt developed at during that time frame was much more favorable than mm-hmm. say, for instance, we go up here to the Teutonic cultures. Uh, mm-hmm. We're looking, you know, this is, this is only a few thousand years after the last major ice age. So anything yeah. up in, in the British Isles, uh, anything up at that that latitude is going to be very very cold, very unforgiving. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly much more difficult to grow crops, and certainly much harder to settle. So if we you know for instance look at um, let me zoom out here and then zoom in on the British Isle. If we look at um, the area north of the Mediterranean, which obviously mm-hmm. gave rise to a lot of popular uh, names in history, you know the the Rome being one of them, you know one of the major empires in history. <clears throat> the the development around the Mediterranean, which was that that area uh, envir- environmentally and ecologically, was much more favorable to agrarian development, and uh, than it was in in the British Isles. So that's why you see, for instance, as and fast forwarding a bit uh, through the Bronze Age, but that's why you see Rome rise to power uh, eventually, and they begin to expand beyond the uh, Italian peninsula. And they start moving uh, up into the uh, Teutonic area, the uh, you know up into Gaul. Uh, Caesar heads into Britannia, where you know he encounters the the Picts. Uh, can you just show me where Gaul is? I always hear this Gaul, that Gaul, this Gaul, well, that. Uh, Spain or Gaul, Gaul <laughs> itself. Let's see, maybe it's on this map, but it, it's it's north of it's immediately north of what what you you would consider Italy, and right just in that north, region north of Italy. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, you see right here where, where this is, you know, essentially, it, yeah. Gaul would essentially be uh, Germany. Oh, Germany. okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know why I uh, thought yeah. it was the, 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 the periphery of Germany and the, and, and the Germanic tribes, that, that's what we see. Gaul, Gaul was uh, Rome's uh, immediate adversary to their north, to the north. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So they were always, that's why Gaul is always mentioned, because they were always fighting Gaul all the yeah. time. Yeah, okay. and, and that, that was the classic... Uh, Gallic society did have some very sophisticated aspects of it uh, when you study it in detail. But I mean, that's the classic, you know, barbarians versus the Roman sort of set piece battles that we. Yeah, right. um, okay, so um, let's get back on track here, though. I don't want to get too far uh, from where we were. Okay, so Bronze Age society. Um, we are looking at uh, four different regions here uh, Near East and Northern Africa which we were just discussing. So the Near East, we're talking about um, this contested area between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, um, that, that, that area where the Hittites eventually came about, where we see the ancient city of Troy, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, ancient Greek epics that you know homer wrote for us that uh, oh, i just watched the odyssey. odyssey like two days ago that's so funny uh yeah. one from 1997 so where exactly is troy troy is in uh what would become anatolia oh, it's like uh, it there is, is it okay yeah it is right yeah just we're going to zoom out for a sec right here that is it, it's one it's one of the most uh contested areas in history really yeah, I mean, think about, yeah what's so special about that well, it's 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 home to an area called the Bosphorus Straits, which are uh, it's their bodies of water. They're they're straits that link uh, essentially link the Mediterranean to the Black Sea. They link east. Oh, west really? West and east. Yeah. So that that little that little key landmass right there, where you see Troy, mm-hmm. and you, you see uh, right immediately east of the uh, aging Greek civilization, the, geographically it provides a throughway. Uh, to major developing civilizations of the period. Right. And, and do you want to go through these straits into the Black Sea so that you can trade with the people on the other side of the Black Sea or what's the trade what or, or take or take what they have. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you can just raid, raid them, right? Yeah. So, so we it, raid or take is other good things on the other side of the sea, right? Exactly. And and what we see there is um, that that area along the Bosphorus Straits, um, uh, Troy is and Troy is one of the big names there. Anatolia is a big name, um, and, mm-hmm. and further 
And around that general region is where we see uh, the Byzantine Empire take root, uh, which is later turned into uh, Constantinople and Istanbul. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that area has been highly contested throughout history as well. Right, but, right, right. Yeah, but in 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 the Bronze Age, uh, around 3300 to 1200 BC, um, the that that was the area uh, of civilization that where where um, we see the rise of the introduction of tin into copper, and we see we see the rise of bronze as a, a instrument and tool and weapon. Uh, so 3300 to 1200 BC, uh, South Asia, on the other hand, go down here. Um, South Asia, it occurred around 3300 to 1200 BC. So it, it was it, almost the same time frame as what we saw over here. And these societies, there's evidence to suggest that some of these societies were, were, were trading uh, at the latter part of this period, that they were, there were people journeying back and forth. Um, in the Bronze Age, uh, you know, some shipbuilding was very primitive and they basically had to remain along coastlines before they, you know, they, they couldn't go out to sea. Uh, but there was evidence of a lot of land trading, especially these river civilizations. So we see some early interaction with major cultures here. Uh, Europe, um, 3200 to 600 BC. And the reason why it took certain elements of Europe to uh, develop into the Bronze Age later is, again, begin, again because of the, the latitude they were at uh, did not necessarily uh, facilitate or stimulate the rise of agrarian societies because they didn't have all the access to all the foodstuffs or resources that were available at uh, mm -hmm. more um, inviting latitude. Right. You're spending all your time getting food and other basic things in an inferior way. You don't have time to do more advanced mm -hmm. things, right? Right. So certain areas of Europe entered the Bronze Age a bit later than uh, areas of uh, what we would consider today the modern day Middle East and Northern Africa. And why is, and, like, I get that bronze is so significant because it's the bronze, it's bronze, but like, mm -hmm. What, what is so good about bronze? Is it just harder, more durable, lasts longer, or what's the deal? Yeah, it's, it, that's exactly it, all, all the above. It, it's okay. it's the, the first use of an alloy. And an alloy, by definition, is when you when you combine two different metals. Yeah. So it, copper in itself is is very like, so very malleable. So as a oh, weapon, yeah. the, the weapons had a very limited lifespan. I mean, I mean you, you can might sharpen them. In your sword breaks or something. Yeah, you could sharpen really easy. I'm sure you could get a pretty fine edge on them if you spent your time with it. But you know, after, after one battle, you know, if, Oh really? After one battle, it's all bunged out of shape and your shields bent and yeah. Wow. Okay. And, well, and, their, and their shields, their shields were, were a lot of times they use wicker shields, you know, they, oh, they'd be okay. in a wicker and wood. So oh, uh, right. you know, it, it, copper obviously is stronger than wood, but you know, when you're, when you're whacking it against the hard surfaces, you know, it's going to uh, lose. Its oh, shape. okay. So the copper is pretty malleable. That's what you're yeah. <laughs> saying, right? Okay, it really bungs out of shape. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So with the introduction of bronze, we see uh, if if someone has a, a bronze helmet on and they're struck with a copper knife, uh, it's really not going to do a tremendous amount of damage. I mean, it's just yep. going to buckle that knife. Oh, okay. And That's the other thing because the other people still have copper. <laughs> yeah. That's a huge advantage, right? Okay. Yeah. And, and whereas a, a copper knife might not necessarily penetrate a wicker shield, especially if you're slashing at it, uh, mm -hmm. a bronze spear thrust into a wicker shield would probably go right through it and impale the person on the other side. So bronze, say that to get a bronze spear into a, uh, yeah, a, bro a, bron a bronze spear into like a wicker shield would, would probably go, you know, straight through that, that okay. shield and kill the person on the other side. So, so weak. So the, copper yeah. By itself was. Yeah, so the people that were able to master bronzing and 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 then working with bronze and especially bronze weapons had a significant technological advantage over those that were still using copper. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of conquering going on when that came out, mm -hmm. I guess. Absolutely. And uh, in East Asia, um, mm -hmm. we see um, this is some of the... Uh, Regionally speaking, in most general terms, this is some of the last areas of the world, specifically in, in Southeast Asia and down here, you know, around uh, Indonesia, places like that, where people um, got access to the technology to use bronze effectively. Now, in China, they, they equipped massive armies, massive standing armies with the various uh, warring states and the various dynasties that, that used bronze weapons. Um, but uh, specifically, when we get down to, to the uh, Austronesian peoples and Indonesia and the Malays and, you know, a areas Southeast Asia, like, you know, uh, Vietnam and, and places like that, what would eventually become Vietnam? The 
the availability of these resources is, is, is somewhat more limited. Mm, and, okay. and the, the availability of uh, wide uh, plains and, and farming areas is a little more limited than what we see in the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East. So again, we, we see a lot of um, coastal tribal cultures that don't necessarily have the level of diversified labor or access to the, the correct uh, natural resources to jump into the Bronze Age at the same time as the rest of the world. All right. Um, so, oh, and one, uh, just to end on the Bronze Age, um, around 1177 BC, there was a very mysterious um, event that occurred. It was called the, uh, the Bronze, Age, Bronze Age Collapse. And it's a it's it's a very it's a mystery to historians and it's a mystery to archaeologists, but it's it's essentially a dark age that occurred before we what we understand as the dark ages today. Everyone points to medieval Europe when they think of the dark ages, but around 1177 BC, very mysteriously, a lot of these um, prominent civilizations that had began developing serious works of art and uh, some of the first forms of writing, um, they they suddenly disappeared. A lot of them, uh, there's a lot of archaeological evidence showing uh. a lot of uh, destroyed cities, uh. Uh, the, a lack of uh, written word, uh, populations began to shrink, um, buildings were deteriorating, there weren't a lot of new structures. And no one is really sure why. They're, they don't mm -hmm. know why. <clears throat> there's a lot of theories uh, that there are these uh, sea people, uh, people that came from the sea somewhere else in the world, and they invaded these uh, prominent Bronze Age cultures, and there is this this massive invasion, but it's it's just difficult to understand uh, how how this all happened at the same time in such a wide area. And oh, there, really? yeah, there there's a, a professor at the George Washington University. His name is Eric Klein. He wrote a book. I believe it's called 1177. I think, uh, um, but he that's his area of specialization. He's he's a fascinating guy to listen to. Um, but there there's a lot of conjecture and a lot of study associated with 1177 BC. That, that's the approximate time when we just see this, this, this small dark age where we just lost a lot of what we would consider forward progress. Um, but I just want to bring that up because it's been yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, weird. Yeah, um, well, what do we have here? This is 1180, it's a little further ahead than we want to go. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna move through the Iron Age pretty quickly because I don't know how we're doing on time, but I wanna, I wanna get through this portion of the outline so we can move on to a different class. Um, do you know how much time we have? Um, my 10, 15. Okay, good, so this won't take long. All right, so the Iron Age was the next leap forward for societies. Uh, and that takes us out of uh, that. It's a transition period from what we consider antiquity to the classical age. So during during the transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, very similar. We just see uh, a change in, in use the use of materials and available resources and the type of technology behind metallurgy and smelting and stuff like that. So we've we've gone from uh, the use of bronze to the use of iron. And again, it's a, it's a transition period where it happens at different areas around the world. Uh, the ancient Near East, we're seeing this happening between 1200 and 500 BC, South Asia, 1200, 200 BC, Europe, right around the same time, uh, Scandinavia, uh, a little begins a little later, again, because it's further north and their specialization and diversification of labor occurred a little later than some other, other areas of the world. Um, the Germanic area, what, what become Germany, entered the Iron Age around 800 AD, so it took a while later for them. Uh, East Asia uh trailed slightly behind the uh, uh ancient near east uh china japan korea south asia southeast asia indonesia um they all came into the iron age at, at various times and the iron age um also the transition period between the bronze age and the iron age covers what we call the period of classical antiquity um mm -hmm. which is classical antiquity typically focuses around the mediterranean sea the, uh, the Greco-Roman period. And I'm just gonna refer back to our outline here. So we're not, we just basically went briefly through the Iron Age transition here. And um, classical antiquity is a broad term for a long period of cultural history centered on the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and we're talking about interlocking civilizations of Greece and Rome, the mm -hmm. Greco-Roman period. All right. 
and it's when we we see the Roman Roman society flourish. Now, if we have to put a, <clears throat> a numbers on this to help out with the idea, we're talking roughly from um, four three to four hundred BC to uh, about uh, the fifth century AD. That that's that was that was the classical and post-classical period, that transition period. And it's really centered around the rise and fall of Rome for all intents and purposes. That's what we see. Although there are different classical periods and post-classical periods in different areas of the world. Uh, it occurred at a slightly different time in China. Uh, for instance, when we look at a uh, completely different uh, course of evolution in Japan, which was a more isolated area, uh, obviously, you know, uh, what would become an island nation. Um, but that said, the, the classical and post-classical period, very important history, especially in relation to Europe and uh, developing empire. Uh, we've been looking at maps from 1300 BC, uh, 1000 BC, and I'm just going to zoom in here. So here's 1000 BC when we're talking about the Bronze Age. And then if we look at 1180, mm. you know, roughly 2000 years later, we're, we're now in the full-blown Iron Age and the... And the um, approaching what we would call the medieval period uh, or in the medieval period rather um, we see the development of all these what would all these countries that would eventually become major nations in Europe uh, mm. Scotland England Brittany Normandy um, so uh, the Roman Empire uh, down in uh, uh, what's interesting about this map is when you look at the Roman Empire 1100 AD the Roman Empire is very far east mm. uh, in the Mediterranean that's because it, it, it the Roman Empire broke into two near the fall of the Western Roman Empire, and it turned essentially into the Eastern Roman Empire, which was ruled by Constantine out of Constantinople. Um, so um, this this was a period uh, around around the fifth century is actually where, uh, well, the fifth century is where we saw the, the, the break. Uh, well, the fourth century is where we see the break in the Roman Empire between Western and Eastern empires. And the fifth century is when we see the fall of the Western Roman Empire, which would eventually give rise to the Latin states. Uh, Latin European states, and then in the East, the traditions of what used to be the Western Roman Empire were carried forward. So it's an amazingly complex period, a lot of transitions, a lot of things going on. Uh, it's, it's obviously mm -hmm. something we can talk about in one session all, all by itself. Um, but uh, this is what we refer to, this transition between the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, Iron Age from the BC, uh, from the late BCs to the early ADs is what we call the, the transition from classical antiquity to post-classical period. Mm -hmm. And that brings us finally to the Middle Ages, which lasted from the fifth to the 14th centuries. This is a Middle Age map. Um, and it began with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire uh, at 476, the fifth century. And um, it ended with the fall of Constantinople in 1453. So, Generally, we look at the Middle Ages as uh, from the 5th century AD to 1500 AD. Mm -hmm. And again, that's a generalization, but it's, it's a neat little way to uh, uh, partition it, I guess we'll say. Mm -hmm. um, and the Middle Ages were broken into three periods. You had the early Middle Ages, which were the time immediately after the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, we see a lot of mass migrations going on during that period. The rise of uh, Christianity had already been on the scene, obviously. Um, for quite a while, but we see the rise of uh, Islam, which gives, uh, which sets, sets the stage for uh, serious monotheistic religious wars. Uh, Viking raids begin to occur in that period, uh, uh, particularly around the 8th, 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries, a lot of Viking raiding. Um, um, the Byzantine Empire uh, uh, turns into Constantinople in the east, and we see the Eastern Roman Empire and uh, the rise of um, what would later become a lot of, uh, of um, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Um, Proto-Latin states, so all the Vikings, when they were done raiding, they began to settle in areas of Europe, and a lot of their influence, uh, either they influenced the indigenous people there, or they, they partitioned the place into their own individual kingdoms, and that's where we see the rise of, you know, the, the Normans, the Franks, um, all these early raiders that basically destroyed Rome, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Vandals, they are they are the bloodlines and the people that would eventually partition Europe and turn it into uh, what it is today. Mm. Um, the High Middle Ages, uh, 1000 to 1300 AD, we see the further revive, uh, refinement and development of the Latin states, and that's what this map is addressing here. Um, after the fall of Western Rome, we see the rise of the Holy Roman Empire, which um, was neither a 
neither holy nor Roman, uh, which is another story, but um, it, that was a highly contested area throughout the entire Middle Ages and it continued on into the modern period. Um, we see uh, a lot of uh, uh, monasticism, um, the, the rise of chivalry here. Uh, when you think of knights and in, in, in flourishing banners and and uh, you know beautiful princesses and everything, uh, this this is the high medieval period. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was also a much grimmer time. We had the Christian uh, heretical movements, um, you know, the, uh, where people were basically being tortured, or you know, they would have, have to renounce their pagan beliefs or be tortured by by um, by the church. Um, and we see uh, the illumination as well. Which uh, the the, illumin the illumination period is where we see you know monks in monasteries and, and they're trying to re they have access to some to some classic text from from a pre previous era uh, from an ancient era uh, some some old works from you know Greece and Rome but they're so far and few in between that that that's what we call this period generally the uh, the Dark Ages the late Middle Ages the Dark Ages because um, generally speaking society was trying to recover from the collapse of the Roman Empire. And there was only small pockets of people, mostly uh, confined to monasteries that were able to study some of these works. And it's not yeah. until much later until the Renaissance where we see the revival of a lot of these works in mainstream society. So even though like, okay, Roman Empire, um, a lot of other societies depended on the Roman Empire in a way because they would trade or whatever. So when the Roman Empire collapsed, other societies suffered as well? Yeah, Roman Empire was was you know a uh, kind of uh, the bright light of civilization in the Mediterranean. Uh, they they offered they offered the law, they offered trade, uh, um, they offered citizenship, which was incredibly important. The areas uh, outside of Rome were incredibly dark. Um, uh, okay. But but after after the second century A.D. and after the after second third century, we we see the steady decline of the Roman Empire for a number of reasons. A lot of internal political upheavals, uh, a lot of uh, religious discontent between uh, the rise of Christianity and old pagan religions, um, a lot of uh, Germanic tribes and nomadic tribes from from the uh, from the immediate north and west. These these cultures were constantly warring with one another, and were eventually some of them were the, the fringe were pushed towards Rome. And they came in contact with them, and, and they they frequently battled. But it wasn't it wasn't necessarily that these these quote unquote barbarians, these dramatic tribes, invaded Rome simultaneously and crushed Rome. It was it was kind of a cultural diffusion. So, you know, from a military history standpoint, when we look at the the Roman legions of the late Republic and the early Roman Empire compared to the late Roman Empire when Rome was about to collapse, completely different animal. You know, they they started out as a very Discipline, very homogenous uh, group that uh, was very efficient at what they did. Mm -hmm. And near the end, it was uh, armies and legions consisted primarily of, of mercenaries and, and people that oh, weren't. Oh, really? Oh, whoa. Yeah. yeah and oh, they're, they're mostly the, 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 the people they were fighting came from the same cultural background as one another. So you, you'd have you know, German mercenaries fighting German, Germanic tribes. And then when you compound that on top of all these these raiders from the further north, the the the, the Vandals, the Visigoths, the all the all the barbarians from the further reaches of civilization, the further fringes, um, you know that's what eventually contributes to the collapse and and our, the transition into the early Middle Ages. But as the Middle Ages went on, uh, we end the, we end the Middle Age period in what we call the Late Middle Ages, which is the 14th. It's generally considered the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. Uh, and that's a period punctuated or, or marked with, uh, not punctuated, but marked with the, the Black Death, the plague, uh, which obviously ravaged Europe. Uh, and we see the rise of um, these really tremendous wars uh, during the late Middle Ages that extend into the modern period. Uh, the Hundred Years War, the, uh, the uh, Eighty Years War, the Thirty Years War. Um, we just see these prolonged conflicts starting in the late Middle Ages um, with the rise of uh, hired hired armies that eventually turn into these um, uh, these these armies that are, are permanently staffed by these vast monarchies and kingdoms and that eventually they transition into the rise of national armies and what we see as nation states further further on mm -hmm. um, but it really sets a stage for the modern period so that in a nutshell is that's that's a very a very uh, condensed uh, 
and a very uh, abbreviated look at uh, how societies formed and how they interacted with one another uh, from prehistory to 1500. And that was, that was a breakneck pace, I think, and there's a lot of important things that we probably didn't cover there. Um, but the point of this was, again, to just provide, provide you with a, a foundation, yeah, an yeah, idea, yeah. Uh, a general overview of yeah. the different periods. And um, what I'd like to do in our, our future meetings is really uh, focus in on these periods, starting with the Bronze Age mm -hmm. and discussing some of the major uh, innovations uh, the major cultures, some of the major conflicts. So okay. I think I think in, what we can do in the next session is discuss the Bronze Age, and then cool. the session after that we can go into the Iron Age, oh, and yeah, the yeah. session after that we can go into Classic Antiquity. Um, or well, that will include Classic Antiquity, but we we I think we could break it into three groups: Bronze Age, Iron Age, and, and Middle Ages. And, yeah, yeah. And over the course of the next three sessions, we're gonna we're gonna start covering more of the meat and potatoes, you know, military history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, conflicts, resolutions, you know, how different societies challenge one another. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. and after that, we should be able to move forward to, to the more modern period. We'll do an overview of that and yeah. then we'll cover specific periods. And yeah, just yeah, yeah. From there. yeah, like how we're just kind of like, you know, you go, you look at very, very, very broad and then you zoom in a bit and then you zoom in more, more, and just get, go like that, yeah. right? Yeah, and that's, that's the entire pattern uh of, of academic history when people begin to I'll specialize in certain it. areas of history is they they find certain periods that are, are particular interest to them and that's that's basically um you know uh, how, how they become quote-unquote experts I'm gonna change the okay i'm gonna end stop live stream